For chapter 8.3 on photosynthesis, um, there are a couple questions that we want to keep an eye on. Um, and these questions, I will have to say, are often paired with questions on transport in plants, um, properties of water, so be on the lookout for those as well. But we want to talk about the conversion of light energy to chemical energy, and of course that's going to happen in what's called the light-dependent reactions. It involves a process called photophosphorylation, so be on the lookout for that. And then in the second part of photosynthesis, the light independent reactions. Okay, so it's a good idea just to kind of keep an eye on like what the heck is happening in photosynthesis. So we're gonna start uh, in the light dependent reactions and the light dependent reactions happen in these guys, they're called the thylakoids and it involves two photosystems. Photosystem two actually happens first, sorry for your luck, okay. After photosystem, there's gonna be an electron transport chain and that electron transport chain is going to generate ATP. All right, and that's a T, I promise. After photosystem two, we're going to have photosystem one, and after photosystem one, there's going to be another electron transport chain because we love them so much, and that is going to produce a compound called NADPH. Okay, not NAD, that's different. NADP, like P, like photosynthesis. To do that, we're gonna need water, okay? We'll talk about why we need water. It's not so plants can be healthy. There's like a legit reason. And this is going to give off oxygen, and that's what we call the light-dependent reactions. Okay, so moving into the light-independent reactions, AKA, aka Calvin cycle, is gonna be this ATP that we made and the NADPH that we're making. We are going to use those to turn carbon dioxide into glucose. So the ultimate goal here is to make glucose. Now, plants can make other things like amino acids, fatty acids, other kinds of sugars, but we can limit our discussion to glucose and live to tell the tale. And this is all happening in an area called the stroma, again, in a process called the Calvin cycle, AKA dark reactions, AKA light independent reactions, AKA I'm sure there are other names for it, but I think we have enough, thank you. All right, let's see if we can figure out what the heck is happening in these photosystems. So again, we are gonna start out with photosystem two. Um, and it happens first. Some people also call it PS680 because that is the wavelength of light at which it works the best. Um, you can call it whatever you want. And that's not true. You can call it PS680 or PS2, photosystem 2. That's it. Those are your choices. So here's how this works. Um, you're going to have to listen to my voice to figure out what kind of annotations you need, but light is going to be absorbed by photosystem 2. And just so we're clear, we're sitting here on the membrane of a thylakoid. That's where these are. And embedded in this um, photosystem are these little accessory pigments. And these accessory pigments are going to absorb a photon of light. That photon is going to be passed from pigment to pigment until it lands at the reaction center. Living in the reaction center is a molecule of chlorophyll A. When that photon hits the chlorophyll A, it is going to excite an electron from that chlorophyll A. That electron is going to be passed down an electron transport chain. Cool, we know how that works. Okay, that electron transport chain is going to um, use the energy from that electron to pump hydrogen ions from out here in the stroma of the chloroplast, like the big uh, empty space, it's over here in the corner, right? They're gonna be pumped from the stroma into the lumen of the thylakoid, okay? The lumen of the thylakoid is really flat and skinny. I'll show it to you over here on the right. So we're over here. Um, so it's flat and it's skinny, so it's going to uh, be able to be very nice in terms of building up a high concentration of hydrogen ions really quickly. It's also sometimes called the thylakoid space. Those words are synonymous. All right, now here's the problem. 
This chlorophyll A molecule is kind of mad that we just took one of its uh, electrons. So we're going to need to replace that electron. That electron is going to come from the splitting of water. So we're going to split water into hydrogen ions. Okay, that's cool because we know that we need them. And into oxygen. All right, so this oxygen is going to combine with another oxygen to make this oxygen gas. And this is what we give off. This is why plants give off oxygen. It's not because they like you and want you to breathe. It's because they needed an electron. Okay, so here's the other product of that process. They need an electron to replace the one that they lost um, in this excitement, okay, to the electron transport chain. This step is done with an enzyme called water splitting enzyme. Very cool stuff. All right, so for the time being, we're just gonna let that electron kind of hang out over here at the end of its electron transport chain. And now we're gonna move on to photosystem one. All right, photosystem one can also be called PS700 for the wavelength of light at which it works the best. Photosystem one is going to absorb its own photon and that photon is gonna get passed from accessory pigment to accessory pigment until it lands at the reaction center. At the reaction center lives a chlorophyll A molecule with an electron. That photon is going to excite this electron and this electron is going to move down its own electron transport chain. And that electron's energy is going to be harvested um, by an enzyme called NADP reductase. And you got it, it is gonna reduce NADP into NADPH. Okay, so now this excited electron that has moved down the chain over here is now part of NADPH. It has been reduced. So this gets oxidized and NADPH gets reduced. And again, that enzyme is called NADP reductase. Okay, so now this chlorophyll molecule is mad that it's missing an electron. Where are we going to get that electron? Or where are we going to get an electron to replace it? That electron comes from the end of the electron transport chain after photosystem 2. So this is what we call non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Ugh. Photophosphorylation comes next, but non-cyclic means that this electron that we lost over here, it doesn't return back to where we got it from. It doesn't work like that, okay? Things keep moving in like a linear fashion and I have to then replace this electron with the one from water, all right? Prokaryotes do cyclic photophosphorylation, they return this, okay, but non-cyclic photophosphorylation means I'm losing this electron from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1, who loses its electron to reduce NADPH, and then I have to replace that missing electron with the splitting of water. All right, so back to this kind of midpoint here, I said that we were going to use this energy from the electron transport chain after photosystem 2 to take a bunch of these hydrogen ions that live in the stroma and actively pump them into the thylakoid space. Yeah, okay, well what are we going to do with them? Well down here in this thylakoid space when we've been accumulating this high concentration, again because it's so skinny, these hydrogen ions are going to passively diffuse out through, you guessed it, this is ATP synthase. Okay, so ATP synthase, I would label that, um, is again doing double duty, is acting both as a protein channel and as an enzyme. Because as these hydrogen ions are passively flowing back through here, this little turbine is going to turn and that is going to catalyze the conversion from ADP into ATP, okay? So here's what we have done so far, okay? And if you can remember this order, you're gonna be good to go. Well, at least it will help you. So first you're gonna do photosystem two. Photosystem two helps you make ATP. Then you're gonna do photosystem one and photosystem one is gonna help you make NADPH. Okay, so if you can remember that, that's gonna help you to kind of talk about these marking points here.
So let's make sure we have a handle on photophosphorylation. It's really similar to oxidative phosphorylation, which we talked about in cell respiration, but this word photo should give you some kind of an indication that we're talking about light energy. So if you see this word out of context, think about photo, oh, photosynthesis, so I should be talking about that kind of stuff. And then phosphorylation has to do with sticking that phosphate group back onto ADP to make ATP, like that whole rigmarole. All right, so here's how um, photophosphorylation works. Um, again, we're taking that electron from photosystem two, passing it along an electron transport chain. We're using the energy from that electron to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma into this really skinny thylakoid space. That builds up a high concentration of hydrogen ions, which then flow passively back out into the stroma through ATP synthase. And that kinetic energy harnessed by um, ATP synthase can catalyze the reaction of ATP. Again, the whole point of the light dependent reactions is to produce ATP and then the NADPH from photosystem one so that we can go to the Calvin cycle and do our thing. It is non-cyclic. Again, that electron does not return to photosystem two. So we need to um, catalyze the conversion of water to oxygen and hydrogen so that we can release that electron to replace the one that we lost from photosystem two. In case you're kind of confused where we're at right now, we just talked about the light dependent reaction. So photosystem two and photosystem one, okay, are part of the light dependent reactions. Photosystem two, the one that happens first, is gonna produce ATP. Photosystem one, the one that happens second, is gonna produce NADPH. Both of those are gonna come over here to the stroma for the Calvin cycle. I think it's also worth noting somewhere on your paper um, the names of the enzymes. So ATP production used ATP synthase. NADPH um, production requires NADP reductase. And um, this splitting of the water molecule required an enzyme called water splitting enzyme. And again, I want to warn you one last time not to confuse NAD with NADP. So NAD is what we used in cell respiration. It's the electron carrier for cell respiration. The P here it does not stand for photosynthesis, but in your brain it's allowed to stand for photosynthesis. So try to keep those straight. To understand the Calvin cycle, you have to do a little bit of math, but I promise it'll be easy. So the whole goal of the Calvin cycle or the light independent reaction is to produce glucose. To make glucose, I'm gonna need six carbons, six hydrogens, and six oxygens. So I need to go do some shopping. The carbons are going to come from carbon dioxide. Okay, so each molecule of carbon dioxide has one carbon. To make one molecule of glucose, which has six carbons, I'm gonna need six molecules of carbon dioxide. So this is just basic balancing of equations, which I'm not gonna do the rest because I don't really care to. I just wanted to like mathematically and visually prove to you that in order to make this one glucose molecule, I'm gonna need six carbon dioxides. And that's gonna be important for a little bit of math we have to do for the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is going to be a lot like the Krebs cycle. It's going to start and end with the same molecule, but this time you do need to know the name of the molecule. This can be abbreviated RUBP. You are allowed to use the abbreviation. However, you also need to be able to recognize the full name, which is ribulose biphosphate. You don't have to spell that, but if you see it in a question, ribulose biphosphate is talking about RUBP. I'll show you how to spell that later. RUBP has one, two, three, four, five carbons. RUBP is going to pick up a carbon dioxide molecule from the air, okay? 
So this should ring a bell if you're talking about, um, if you've already studied plants, about like the palisade mesophylls and how they have the spongy mesophyll beneath them to facilitate gas diffusion. Anywho, so they need carbon dioxide from the air. So we're going to take this carbon dioxide molecule and stick it on the end of this RUBP molecule. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this molecule. This step is catalyzed by an enzyme called ribulose biphosphate carboxylase, aka Rubisco. Classic mistake people make is mixing up RUBP and Rubisco. Don't fall for it. Rubisco is the shortened ver uh, version of the enzyme, R ribulose biphosphate carboxylase. Again, you're allowed to use the abbreviation, but if you see the long way uh, written out in a question, you have to know it's talking about the enzyme carboxylase. So here's how we can use the name to kind of decipher this. Ribulose biphosphate is RUBP. That's what that stands for. Carboxylase is an enzyme, ACE, that is going to stick a carbo, carbon, onto RUBP. So that's how we get that name there. So now I have a six carbon molecule, one from the carbon dioxide, five from RUBP, and again that step was catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco. You don't have to know the name of this intermediate six carbon compound, but you do have to know the name of the compound that we get when we break it in half. Okay, so this is called glycerate 3 phosphate. Again, it is okay to use the abbreviation, but you also have to recognize the long written out form just in case that's used in a question. So let me do some math for you real quick. I had six RUBPs to which I added six carbon dioxides, one on to each. So six of these, if I attach one of each to each of them, I now have six of these six carbon molecules. If I have six of these big guys and I break each one in half, I now have 12 smaller three carbon G3Ps. Hopefully you got that because I can't explain it to you because I'm in a video. These GPs are going to get reduced to something called a TP. This is known as a triose phosphate. Tri meaning three, os meaning sugar, so a three carbon sugar phosphate. So if I need this to get reduced, that means I need to add energy, I need to add electrons to this. Okay, so this is going to get reduced, which means something else has to get oxidized. And that something else is going to be NADPH. Okay, so I'm going to steal the electrons from NADPH and I'm going to use them to reduce G3P into TP. So this is going to get reduced. That's supposed to be an R. Okay, let's try that again. So this is going to get reduced and if I'm going to reduce something I need to oxidize something else. I'm also going to add in some energy from ATP. Okay, so what this is telling me is if I'm spending energy from NADPH and from ATP, that the TPs, the triose phosphates, have way more energy than the G3Ps. So unlike the Krebs cycle where you're stealing energy away from those compounds, here we're adding energy into them. So I have 12 triose phosphates, 12 of these guys. Okay, not all of them are gonna remain in the cycle. Two of the TPs, so this high energy reduced sugars, okay, they are going to leave the cycle. And they are going to connect with each other to form glucose. So check your math. Two TPs, which have three carbons each, are gonna to combine to make a six carbon compound called glucose. And this is why glucose has so much energy in it, because I used all of the energy by reduce, nope, by oxidizing these compounds to reduce the GPs into TP. So these are reduced high energy molecules, which I'm gonna to stick together to make glucose. So let's check our math here. I had 12 TPs. 
two of them left to make glucose. That means I have 10 of these guys left. 10 times the three carbons, so each one of them has one, two, three carbons, gives me a total of 30 carbons to play with. Now, keep in mind that the Calvin cycle is a cycle. And what does a cycle mean? Well, cycle means you start and end with the same compound, and that compound is RUBP. So I need six RUBPs. RUBP has one, two, three, four, five carbons. So if I need six RUBPs and they have five carbons each, that means I need a total of 30 carbons, which wouldn't you know it is exactly what I have left. So I can't use any more of these TPs to make glucose because I need to use all of these 30 carbons to regenerate the RUBPs. So I have these triose phosphates and I'm going to use them to remake my RUBPs. We already know the math works out, but look at this arrangement of molecules here. So I have three carbon compounds. I'm gonna need to take them apart and rearrange them to make some five carbon compounds. And anytime you're taking molecules apart and rearranging them, you're gonna have to invest some energy. Some of that energy is gonna come from ATP. So I need to invest some ATP energy. I need to spend some ATP energy for this regeneration process. And that's okay. Remember, we made ATP in the light dependent reaction. So that's cool, I have some to spend. It's also important in addition to all of the molecules that you understand the different parts of the Calvin cycle. So this first part here, where we're attaching carbon dioxide to RUBP with the help of Rubisco, that is something called carbon fixation. And again, carbon fixation is just the act of attaching that carbon dioxide molecule to RUBP. It's catalyzed by the enzyme called Rubisco. So this first part of the Calvin cycle is called carbon fixation. Sometimes you'll see multiple choice questions that'll say like, where in the chloroplast does carbon fixation take place? Well, then you have to remember carbon fixation is part of the Calvin cycle. Calvin cycle happens in the stroma. So don't freak out, just kind of try to remember your steps there. The next part is called the reduction phase. Now, it could easily be called oxidation if you knew what you were talking about, but let's talk about this. The G3P is getting reduced to form the TPs, okay? So if the G3P is getting reduced, something else has to get oxidized, and that something else is going to be the NADPH. Okay, so the NADPH is going to donate its high energy electrons to the G3P so that it can become TP. And the last phase here is RUBP gener regeneration. So the most likely question that we're gonna get about that is that you understand that that's gonna require some ATP and that you understand that that ATP comes from the light dependent reaction. So it's all about kind of understanding where stuff comes from. Back in like big picture stuff, again, here's what happened. After photosystem two, the first one, we produced ATP. We had to use that ATP in the Calvin cycle to make TPs and to regenerate our UBPs. We made NADPH after photosystem one, which happened second, and we used that again to reduce the G3Ps into TPs. Now, this NADPH isn't its reduced form anymore. It gets oxidized to form NADP, and that ATP, well, we use the energy from it, so that becomes ADP. They head back over to the thylakoid, okay, to um, become part of the cycle again. So common question that we get about this is about ATP production in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis absolutely does produce ATP, but the rest of the cell doesn't get to use it. So it's not for the rest of the cell to use. It's only for the Calvin cycle to use. So just be careful that you're reading that question carefully. All right, so some parts of the chloroplast that we should probably know. 
Um, these stacks of thylakoid discs are called granum, and they, again, are flat. Those thylakoids are flat because having them be flat discs instead of just one blobby increases the surface area um, for those membranes. Again, all the photosystems are just on the thylakoid membranes. So everywhere where there's a thylakoid membrane, you can have a photosystem. So that's why it's better to be a stack of discs instead of just one big blobby. Um, let's see. Also, the fact that they're a flat disc um, also means that the space inside is really small, and that's good for being able to quickly accumulate those hydrogen ions. All right, the thylakoid again, the membrane is where those electron transport chains and the ATP synthase and the photosystems, that's where those are located um, on an electron micrograph. That's where they show up to be darker. These are the parts that contain all the pigments, like chlorophyll. The stroma out here, like this stuff, is clear because it doesn't need to contain any pigments because pigments are for light-dependent reactions and it's the light-independent reactions that are happening in the stroma. So in the stroma, we've got all the enzymes necessary for the Calvin cycle, so definitely talking about that rubisco. If you get a question about enzymes, you're probably going to be asked about where they're located. Rubisco is in the stroma. The thylakoid is where we're going to have ATP synthase, NADP reductase, and the water splitting enzyme. Okay, um, so the double membrane part, the fact that there are two, again, that's because of the way that chloroplast and mitochondria um, were formed in terms of being uh, enveloped via endocytosis by early eukaryotes. Okay, so um, you don't really need to know much about the lamella, about connecting the thylakoid stacks, but I would definitely know about where stuff is located. Some of the processes in photosynthesis and respiration are pretty similar, okay? So they both uh, rely on ATP generation. If you get a command term that says compare, please, please, please remember that compare means similarities and differences and that you have to refer to both throughout. So if you're talking about the differences between two things, you have to refer to the qualities of both of the things that you're comparing. So when I get the command term compare, um, I like to build a little t-chart with a spot up above for similarities. So I have a spot for similarities and then I kind of have like a t-chart for like whatever it is that I'm comparing here. So some similarities between the, the ATP uh, that we get in photosynthesis and uh, in respiration is that again they're both producing ATP. Um, both of them are using an electron transport chain and that electron transport chain contains the enzyme ATP synthase. Both of them rely on building up a high concentration of hydrogen ions, aka protons, and then having them diffuse passively through ATP synthase. And when I say building up a concentration, of course that means active transport. So let's then talk about how they're different. In photosynthesis, that's that photophosphorylation. So light energy is going to be used to excite the electron used for the electron transport chain. Okay, in respiration, it's a little bit different. So again, instead of using light energy, okay, those electrons that are donated from like NADH and FADH2 are coming from the com uh, carbon compounds that were oxidized. So like that acetyl-CoA or that pyruvate. In photosynthesis, the hydrogen ions are going to be pumped into the thylakoid space or the lumen, which is really skinny, and then diffuse back out into the stroma. During respiration, they are pumped into the intermembrane space and then they diffuse back into the matrix. This is by far the most common question that we get about this is understanding where they're going. So again, in photosynthesis, they're getting pumped into the thylakoid space and then they diffuse back passively through the stroma. Respiration, they're pumped into the intermembrane space and then they diffuse back into the matrix. If you cannot remember those, 
always then remember that things are gonna get pumped to where the space is really small and skinny so that you can develop a concentration gradient really quickly. And then that will help you remember, okay, just find the skinny space, that's where they're getting pumped into, and then they diffuse pa uh, passively back into the larger space. All right, and then the other difference is just about location in photosynthesis. Um, that is located on the electron transport chain. And in respiration, the electron transport chain is located on the cristae. And then the last little bit that I would encourage you to add here is just understanding that they have different names. So in photosynthesis, we're producing ATP through photophosphorylation. And in respiration, that's called oxidative phosphorylation, or at least that step where it's ATP synthase doing that. So some of the great questions um, that we get, not necessarily from IB, but from students is like, oh, how do we know all this? All right, so that's something that we actually do need to know from this chapter, um, which was basically how did someone figure out the Calvin cycle? Well, that was done um, from Calvin. And so Calvin's lollipop experiment is something um, pretty cool here. So he was growing algae in these flat glass containers and they looked like lollipops. That's how it got its name. And in general, when you want to take something that is invisible, like a carbon atom, and you want to make it visible, Visible, you grow it in radioactive medium. So we've seen that in a ton of other experiments like Karen's technique for autoradiography um, and some other ones. So radioactivity helps us to track things and helps make things more visible. Anywho, so he was letting these uh, algae do photosynthesis in this radioactive medium. And at different time intervals, he was putting his algae in hot alcohol. And so what that was doing was basically destroying all the enzymes necessary for um, photosynthesis and stopping the cell metabolism. So if we think about the Calvin cycle, and one thing I probably didn't do a good job of mentioning is when we go from each step, like the RUBP to the six carbon compound, to the GPs, to the TPs, all of those reactions are controlled by enzymes. So when you stick your algae in hot alcohol, you're stopping the metabolism because you're denaturing the enzymes. So when he would stop it at different points, he would then um, use chromatography, which separates plant pigments, um, and then making, again, making all this stuff visible, he was able to see that at different points, he had different compounds. And so that's how all those different intermediate compounds, like the G3Ps, like the TPs, that's how they were discovered. So not overnight, not on a whim, but through a lot of hard work. Let's go through some of these questions that we were going to keep an eye on here. So explaining the process by which light energy is converted to chemical energy is just another way of asking you to explain the light dependent reactions. So you want to say that that light is converted into chemical energy in photosynthesis. Um, chlorophyll absorbs light. That absorption excites electrons and those electrons are going to pass along electron transport chains. The energy from those electrons are gonna pump protons across the thylakoid membrane into the thylakoid space. Okay, that is used to make ATP because those uh, protons are gonna diffuse back through ATP synthase. Um, those pigments that are gonna absorb that photon of light to begin with are arranged in photosystems. That electron from photosystem two, which again happens first, um, is gonna to flow to the photosystem two. In photosystem two, that electron is going to be used to reduce NADP into NADPH. And so we now have at the end of this two main products. We have reduced NADP, which you can call NADPH, that's fine, and ATP. Those are our two big products there. All right, and then those um, carbohydrates in the Calvin cycle are going to carry the energy that we just um, converted from light energy into chemical energy. So when we talk about the conversion of light energy to chemical energy, what they're talking about is how did all this energy in light come to be part of ATP and NADPH and what are those going to be used for? Eight marks. 
So here's kind of another way of asking a similar question, explaining the role of water in the light dependent reaction. Okay, so if you can't remember what water does, that's okay. There's plenty of other things to write about. And by the way, if you had trouble annotating your diagram, use some of these mark uh, points to do so. All right, so water plays a role in non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Okay, and so we'll come back to that uh, in just a second. Again, chlorophyll absorbs lights and it activates the electrons in photosystem two, which is going to be passed along to a carrier. We have to replace that electron. That's what non-cyclic means. And that's going to come from photolysis, which is the splitting of water. When we split water, it's going to produce oxygen, hydrogen ions, and electrons. The oxygen is released as waste, and that electron is what replaces the lost electron in photosystem 2. That's why it's non-cyclic. The electrons from photosystem 2 are going to pass to photosystem 1, and we need them in photosystem 1 because photosystem 1 absorbs its own photon, excites its own electron, so that it can reduce NADP to NADPH. That electron flow, again from photosystem 2, so we're back at the beginning, causes protons to be pumped across the thylakoid membrane into the thylakoid space, which creates a proton gradient. And then we're able to do chemiosmosis. Um, things flow passively back through ATP synthase to make ATP. All right. So here's, again, another way of asking a very similar question, explain the process of photophosphorylation. So let's look at what's in this one. Defining photophosphorylation, talking about where the energy comes from, it comes from light. Okay, and then you're gonna notice a lot of these things are the same with the other questions. We split water to gain an electron. We need that replacement electron because we're gonna excite electrons to go down electron transport chains, and we're using the energy from that electron transport chain to pump protons to build up a gradient in the thylakoid space so they can diffuse back through ATP synthase to make ATP, okay? So this one has a little bit more um, of an emphasis on photophosphorylation, so you're gonna notice that there are like some more marks here for specifically talking about how they work. I would honestly include these other ones in the other questions as well that weren't specifically about this. More is better as long as you don't contradict yourself, okay? Here's one where we see marks are awarded for a clearly annotated diagram. We didn't see those in the other one. So let that be your lesson. Don't always rely on a diagram. It's not in all mark schemes. Include it when you can, especially if it helps you remember what words to write, but make sure it's annotated and make sure you don't do just a diagram. All right, so in this last one, explaining the light independent reaction is basically walking someone through the Calvin cycle. So we can say where it occurs. The energy is going to come from the products of the light dependent reaction, so ATP and NADPH. It's also known as the Calvin cycle. It involves carbon fixation where we're going to attach that carbon dioxide to RUBP. Again, it's okay if you say RUBP. It's also okay if you spell it out. That carbon fixation is gonna be helped by the enzyme called Rubisco. Again, you can say Rubisco or you can spell out the full name, ribulose biphosphate carboxylase. That forms a six carbon compound, which you don't need to know the name of, but you do need to, do need to know that it splits in half. When it splits in half, it's called a G3P molecule. You can abbreviate it there, that's fine. The G3P is going to get reduced into TPs or triose phosphates. And if, if G3P is being reduced, that means something else needs to get oxidized, and that something else is NADPH. The, some of the TPs are gonna leave the cycle to become glucose, but most of the TPs are going to be used for RUBP regeneration, and that process requires ATP.